question. My name's Nate Anderson, and I'm a research forester with the Rocky Mountain Research Station, and that's one of the research stations of the U.S. Forest Service. And um, many people know the, the National Forest Systems branch of the Forest Service. That's by far the largest and most well-known. They're in charge of managing the national forests. But the Forest Service also has a research and development wing, what we call R&D, and that's uh, what the Rocky Mountain Research Station is part of that R&D branch. Um, and the research scientists who work for the Forest Service work in, in um, stations like the Rocky Mountain Research Station, Pacific Northwest Station, the Forest Products Lab, and some others all spread around the country. So thanks for, thanks for the invitation, and um, I'll just get started. And we'll, we'll, we, I will definitely leave time for questions at the end uh, and, um, and potenti potentially some discussion. So, so my goals for today for all of you are to really just get a general understanding of the biomass and bioproduct supply chain. And I'm really going to focus on management and economics, particularly economics from the stand level and forest level and kind of the individual firm. I won't be talking too much about non-market economics and some broader concepts, but focus mostly on uh, more, more of the financial aspects of biomass and bioenergy. And uh, the kind of the core piece of that will be three examples of research projects that I'm working on uh, with some detail about how they all kind of fit together. And definitely, as I mentioned, want to leave some opportunities for discussion and questions uh, at the end. So I'll give you a little bit of background, uh, just enough to, to frame these topics, and then talk about three specific topics in detail. All are components of the biomass and, and broader bioproducts supply chain. One is production, the production of biomass on the landscape. The next is logistics. And the third is conversion technology. And again, I'll be talking about these topics mostly from a management and uh, economic standpoint. Give you a brief summary and then open it up to questions and discussion. Beth, if, if, you, if there's any problem with the audio or anything, just let me know. So just to lay things out up front, what I, what I hope you take away from this particular presentation um, are, are these several points. One is that we really need, when we talk about biomass as a resource and biomass utilization, we really need to have a clear understanding of what the end use is. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But really, the end use is going to drive the biomass supply chain. And that's really important. Um, the next is that biomass production, in the context that we talk about uh, biomass production in, in forest management, is really meeting multiple objectives. and Production for industrial use is actually, in many cases, a pretty minor objective, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the other is that when we talk about biomass costs and the economics, logistics is a really important thing, and uh, the logistics really determine biomass costs, and we can get lost in some of the details uh, about long-run uh, supply, but Logistics are really an important factor here, and hopefully you'll come away with that, that message. And then the other idea here is that profitable conversion is possible. Uh, we talk a lot about how challenging it is to make biomass into electricity and heat and fuels and other products, but it is possible. And probably the biggest thing and the most general thing is that details matter. I'm, when we're talking about biomass, bioenergy, bioproducts, it's easy to fall into uh, discussions where we're talking in, in kind of general terms about what's good and bad, what's efficient and inefficient, but really the details of specific cases make a big difference in uh, you know, both the environmental sustainability but also the economic uh, viability of, of these technologies. So those are what I hope you come away with as take-home messages. So the first piece of background information I want to share with you is just that the, the U.S. Forest Service has uh, very specific research goals when it comes to bioenergy and bio-based products, and they're outlined in this uh, document. It's called the uh, Bioenergy and Bio-Based Products Strategic Direction. And the three general goals in this document are, are sustainable and economic forest biomass management and production systems. The second is competitive low emissions conversion systems. 
So competitive me meaning eco economically competitive or in, in the context of market competition. So we're looking for competitive low emissions conversion systems. And then the third goal for forest service R&D in this area is information and tools for decision making and policy analysis. And I want to point out some important assumptions here in this document. One is that we're, we're, we are talking about working landscapes. And that means when, whenever I'm talking about bioenergy and bio-based products uh, from forest biomass, I'm talking about lands that are appropriate for harvesting. And we know that all lands aren't appropriate for harvesting. Some lands are not appropriate. Uh, places like wilderness areas, uh, places that have sensitive habitats, uh, certain endangered species may, may make it um, inappropriate for biomass harvesting, areas that are very difficult to get to or otherwise sensitive. So we, we know that. So we're already talking about uh, working landscapes where this is an appropriate, um, appropriate uh, forest management tool. We're also talking, it, for the most part, about lands that have diverse objectives, not just a symbol, a, a, a simple uh, timber management objective, but maybe uh, a suite of objectives that we're trying to maintain and, and achieve, including uh, habitat, wildlife habitat, recreation, aesthetics, um, and other types of values, watershed protection, those sorts of things. And then we also want to make sure that we're talking about the full suite of products that might be able to be produced from uh, these materials. So that, that includes bioenergy, like electricity from biomass, biofuels, and bioproducts, as well as heat. So here's a generic bioproducts supply chain. And you can see it, it starts on the left with feedstock production on the landscape, and the feedstock production component includes cultivation, silviculture, and sustainability metrics, things like impacts on soils and water, uh, water resources. I'm not going to talk about those today, um, but hopefully we'll have other webinars devoted to those topics if we haven't already. Um, so in the feedstock production category, we're, we're talking about everything from very intensively managed short rotation, high yield plantations all the way up to very lightly managed, naturally regenerating forests and, and everything in between. So we move from feedstock production to feedstock logistics. And when I talk about logistics as a component of the supply chain, this includes the harvesting and collection, kind of the in-forest aspects of this, the logging systems that we use, the, the collection, and, and maybe some processing out in the forest that we do, things like chipping and grinding to get that material in a form that we can ship it to market. We're also talking about transportation and storage and um, different options for configuring the, the different components of the logistics uh, aspects of the supply chain. So harvesting, collection, processing, transport, and storage. Then at some point we have to convert that material to um, something that's useful. That might be heat and power, it might be bioproducts, liquid fuels, other types of products. And then get those products to people who can use them through distribution channels. You can see that when we talk about distribution in the supply chain, distribution channels for liquid fuels are going to be quite different than for heat and electricity or some sort of, uh, say, activated carbon for filtering that could be shipped long distances relatively safely. Um, and then the end of the supply chain is really the end use. Who's using the product, whether it be electricity or uh, a drop-in gasoline-type fuel or diesel fuel, biodiesel, some sort of solid product like activated carbon, um, all of the end uses. And really, this end use is what's going to drive everything else. So often in the forestry world, we're very, very focused on the first thing, which is feedstock production. We have a lot of biomass. Biomass is produced on the landscape as a byproduct of forest management, and we want to do something with it especially when we're burning it in huge piles for disposal. We want to use that, but really we need to be more focused on what, it's, what is it going to be used for? What's the end use here? So today I'm going to focus on the first three legs of this supply chain, feedstock production, 
feedstock logistics, and conversion technology. I also want to point out that this is the bioproduct supply chain, but sometimes you hear people talk about the biomass supply chain. When we talk about the biomass supply chain, we're really talking about these first two legs, kind of the uh, forest to gate or forest to facility, forest to conversion piece of the puzzle. And so that's the biomass supply chain. So here's a common bioproduct supply chain in parts of the country that have a robust forest products industry. We have treatments going on in the landscape. A lot of times those treatments are for timber harvest, but we can have other types of treatments for, uh, for thinnings, for um, fuel reduction thinnings, or um, wildlife habitat improvement, or other types of activities. And those generate uh, roundwood in the form of saw logs and pulpwood. And one of the byproducts of that is forest residues. So these are the tops, the limbs, the uh, parts of the stem that don't meet the saw log and pulpwood requirements. So they might be rotted or they might have some other problems. And those materials can go to sawmills to make lumber. They can go to pulp mills to make pulp for paper. And a lot of times the residues from that that harvesting goes into boiler and cogeneration facilities that provide heat and power for industry and provide electricity to the grid. And this is very common in certain parts of the country, not everywhere, but overall the U.S. forest industry includes, accounts for 50 percent of biomass consumption in the country, and that includes um, ethanol, corn ethanol, and 25 percent of all renewable energy consumption. So those are significant numbers, and I think they're, they're underappreciated by most people how much of a player the forest products industry is in renewable power and renewable energy in general, mostly through uh, cogeneration of heat and power by burning forest residues in, in boilers. So unfortunately, in a lot of parts of the West, the interior West, the Rocky Mountains, we've lost a lot of forest industry in, in infrastructure. Almost all of our pulp mills, with the exception of one uh, in Lewiston, Idaho, and uh, as a result, we uh, have have lost that outlet for using residues for heat and power. In addition, a lot of the mills that are left have aging boiler systems, aging infrastructure, so they have substituted fossil fuels for heat and power, and that leaves us in a situation where we're, it's more difficult for us to use those residues for bioenergy and they are generally in, in a lot of cases burned for disposal. And sometimes that includes uh, pulp quality material as well because pulp markets that could use that for producing paper are so far away uh, that it makes it difficult to transport those, uh, those materials efficiently. And one of the things, one of the outcomes is that it makes it more difficult and sometimes more expensive to get treatments done on the landscape. So I'll talk just briefly about one more bioproduct supply chain that people are very excited about. And this is basically, you know, sums up what's next. Is there something that might fill this uh, vacuum in terms of using these materials instead of burning them in place for disposal. So a lot of people are interested in smaller scale uh, equipment that might be able to use forest residues, uh, these biomass byproducts for liquid fuels, for uh, many of you know what biochar is, this carbon product that can be used as a soil amendment. Um, Potentially that same biochar can be used as a raw material in the manufacture of industrial carbon products like activated carbon. My research group is very interested in that as a high value, kind of value added proposition for biochar as a byproduct of uh, bioenergy and biofuel production. And, you know, even potentially the mills getting in the game here with diversifying their product portfolios uh, and using these byproducts for heat and power, what we call process heat and power, and that's just jargon for uh, the heat and power required by our industrial operations for manufacturing. So there are a lot of a lot of different options for this. Um, so that's just all the background that I want to go into, 
And now I want to talk about three legs of that supply chain in more detail. One is the production aspect. How do we think about bio, biomass production on the landscape? The next is uh, logistics. And the third is conversion technology. So this, this is a graphic that's right out of a Rocky Mountain Research Station recent uh, publication. Uh, it's called Science You Can Use, and you can just, uh, just Google RMRS Science You Can Use, and this uh, publication will pop up. It's focused on practitioners in the field and, and other folks um, that are interested in this topic. And I want to use this graphic just to illustrate that really, w when we talk about biomass production, we start with forest management. And as you all know, forest management, especially in the West, is a pretty complex proposition. We have forests, and we manage them pr for a pretty broad range of management objectives. Uh, those include not just timber, but uh, most often recreation and uh, watershed protection, um, habitat for uh, various species, um, existence value, spiritual value, a, a pretty broad range of, of uh, values and objectives. And those forest management obje objectives drive treatments on the landscape. So in some cases we can use silvicultural treatment to achieve those objectives or to uh, optimize the outputs of those objectives. And hopefully those forest treatments are informed by field data and good, good science, good quality science, what we call in the Forest Service the best available science. Especially when it comes to predicting potential environmental impacts. Um, again, I won't be talking about those today, but that is really at the core of what we do in terms of forest management, even on private land. So private industrial lands uh, still want to be implementing best management practices to maintain long-term productivity. So once those treatments are prescribed, the silvicultural treatments are prescribed, um, we have different you know, potential outputs for biomass, that material that's a byproduct. And that biomass includes the non-merchable uh, you know, segments of the trees, the tops, the limbs, things like that. And there may be some, hopefully some merchantable segment in terms of saw logs and pulpwood that can be sold to help offset costs. Or maybe even in a timber management standpoint, uh, generate net revenue for the treatment. And that's the point where we plug this into biomass logistics. Logistics are not the starting point, but really forest management and treatment is the starting point. So let's take a concrete example from Colorado. I'm going to talk about the Uncapagre Plateau um, in southwest Colorado. Some of you may have been, been down in this area. Uh, this is the Uncapagre National Forest, and we have been working on a project uh, with stakeholders in that area focused on biomass supply. So let's just walk through um, this area and how we might think about this plateau as a, as a potential source of biomass supply. So this area has diverse forests. It, it goes from 4,000 feet in elevation up to over 10,000 feet. It has mixed conifer forests and aspen. Down at the lower elevations, it has pinyon juniper forests and, and pine forests. You can see that uh, pinyon juniper on the bottom left and aspen. A lot of the aspen is suffering from uh, aspen decline and mortality due to aspen decline. And then a pretty, pretty mixed landscape. It's kind of a neat place. We have a lot of active management going on there. As I mentioned, you know, these management, um, the management there prescribes different silver cultural treatments to meet different objectives depending on the forest types. Um, there's thinning for fuel hazard reduction for fire mitigation. Uh, there's timber harvest to, to uh, harvest timber. Aspen clear cut cuts for regeneration, regenerating those aspen stands. Um, and there's also utility corridors up there. And when you hear the word salvage, salvage really means salvaging economic value. So salvaging timber that is damaged by beetles or disease or insects. Um, that the silvicultural definition of a salvage treatment is one to salvage economic value. So these treatments produce a lot of different biomass byproducts. Sometimes they're in these big slash piles um, that you can see on the top right. Sometimes those slash piles, in the case of aspen, have some really large diameter materials in there, um, that bottom right. 
And this aspen pile here on the left is uh, aspen that's not suitable for saw logs, but that was removed as part of treatments to try to regenerate these aspen stands up on the plateau. So there are some biomass byproducts. Um, so let's let's look in a little more detail how we try to think about biomass supply and production in terms of the supply chain, especially in this national forest context. Here are the political boundaries of the forest, and here's what that looks like uh, from a satellite with some roads superimposed over it. So this is the study area that we're talking about. Those of you familiar with the area can see uh, Delta and Montrose and uh, Nucla there. Nucla has a little diamond near it. That's a uh, coal-fired power plant that has potential for co-firing, that is mixing biomass with coal for electric power production. So one of the important things is, well, what's up there in terms of forests? We really need to start with boots on the ground and an understanding of what the forests are. And as I mentioned, they're pretty diverse across this area. We've got juniper in that classic low elevation pinion juniper dryland uh, forest. We've got aspen, aspen mixed together with conifer, ponderosa pine. Um, something that shows up as white here is kind of scrubland, uh, gamble oak. These are land fire classifications, and we could we could use different classifications, but these are useful just to see the different types of forests that are up there. So this is an important starting point. But it's also very important that we have a good handle on management objectives. As I mentioned, our biomass supply is not an objective per se. The biomass supply that we're going to quantify in just a minute is really a product of meeting different types of management objectives. And we know that management objectives vary wildly by ownership, um, and they also, even within an ownership, can vary, be pretty diverse. So let's look at the uh, Capadre National Forest. We know there are areas that are backcountry, that are classified as wilderness or primitive use areas, minimal use areas, and really biomass production is incompatible with that management objective. We're not going to go into wilderness areas or roadless areas or, or backcountry areas to extract biomass. Um, but then there are act areas that are more active management, um, kind of general forest that includes timber harvest. These utility corridors certainly uh, get managed pretty heavily to keep them free of vegetation and, and other types of uses. So we can boil that down into this idea that we have areas that are suitable for removal. Uh, in the green, and then areas that are definitely not suitable. So we're not going to have any biomass coming out of those areas, and that's important. Um, so management objectives are where we start here. Another important thing that I want to point out, especially for public land management agencies, is often we, they're, they are constrained in terms of how much area they can treat in a given year or over the course of a study. So when we talk about annual constraints on treatment, some of the things that play into that are just administrative capacity. You know, how, how many uh, employees are there managing the forest? How many timber sales and stewardship contracts can they put up in a year? How many contracts can they manage? Those sorts of constraints. Those tend to come into play well before we meet um, biological constraints on things like uh, growth to harvest ratios. Uh, that's a little bit of jargon, but we don't want the harvest to exceed growth, right? Uh, that's that's we're exceeding our sustainable yield. Um, most of the time, in, on these types of forests, we're gonna we're gonna hit administrative barriers well before we hit any uh, any constraint like that. So let's just look at this by species. I won't go through all these numbers, but based on the forest plan for this particular national forest, even though aspen has the largest biomass and even though uh, some of these pine forests may have the most um, valuable timber, we really need to spread out the treatment across all kinds of different uh, all kinds of different forest types to meet ownership objectives. If our only objective was to generate net positive revenue, we would focus on those forest types that generate uh, the most valuable saw timber, but um, that's not what we're doing here. We're, we're going to spread these out over different types of different cover types. So that's an important constraint here. So one way we manage forests is by compartmentalizing them into different stands. 
Uh, I have it labeled here treatment polygons, but I'll just, um, this will make sense in just a minute. But we can zoom in on this, and you can see the road network in black, um, little dots where we could potentially bring logs or biomass to the roadside to deliver to some market, and then those uh, little polygons showing you different stand structures um, and nuclea there in the bottom left with the diamond, the yellow diamond showing you the facility that might take biomass for energy. So in this context, we can look at all these, um, all these polygons on the landscape. We, look, we can look at above ground biomass, and I don't have uh, enough time to go into the technical details of how we can estimate this, but it's a combination of field work and remote sensing and, and uh, statistical analysis. But we can look at different polygons. And again, if, if all we were thinking about is producing biomass, we would focus on those polygons that have the highest amount of biomass, those, those dark green polygons, and just go get those, cut them, and deliver them to uh, the power plant. But that's not really how we manage forests. And so it'll, it'll, this is just our baseline. So we have above ground biomass, and we know that only a certain amount of that within each polygon, potentially a third or less, is actually recoverable, either in the form of, uh, of logs or um, this biomass byproduct. And so we can adjust those estimates based on the, the, um, the amount of biomass we expect to be recoverable from these treatment units. And then another thing we factor into these models is operations costs. We know that um, and uh, this will make more sense in, in just a minute, but we know that uh, conditions on the ground have a really big impact on how much it costs to, to cut down trees and remove them. Things like how steep the ground is, how big the unit is, how, average, how, how long the distance is you have to drag the logs or move the biomass before you get to a road. Um, other types of conditions like how uh, dense the stands are or how difficult the terrain is, how rocky it is, these all uh, factor into operations costs. And those can be, you know, at the low end, in this particular case, $9 or $10 a ton when we're talking about biomass, all the way up to $70 a ton or more. Um, and so it's important to understand those. And then we also know transportation costs. Again, the black lines are roads. And the farther away we are from that diamond, um, the longer it's going to take us to get to uh, that facility and the more that's going to cost. So we go from a low of $70 per trip, for, per round trip, to over $800 a round trip for some of those red areas where they're very difficult to get out and it's a long haul all the way around to get to the power plant. So keep that in mind as well. We can combine operations costs and transportation costs into what we're calling a logistics cost here. And I'll give you an example of boots on the ground with some, uh, I know you're probably sick of maps at this point, but uh, we'll get out of the maps in just a minute and look at some operations on the ground. But um, in terms of maps, we can look at the total cost per bone dry ton to nucle as ranging from $18 a ton, which is pretty, pretty reasonable, up to uh, almost $100 a ton from some of these more difficult to reach units that are more difficult to harvest. So this is the last set of maps. I just want to show you a supply model. This is how we think about production in terms of supply. This is harvest year one, and you'll see the pink polygons, the pink stands, are uh, stands that we're, we're looking at for treatment. And you notice they're not all close to that diamond. These stands are spread across different cover types um, in different regions of the forest to meet different management objectives. If our only objective was to generate cheap biomass, we would put all of those polygons as close as we could to that yellow diamond, right? Um, that would be the shortest haul distance. We'd also locate those polygons in probably aspen stands, which have very high above ground biomass, uh, very efficient to harvest and we do it on flat ground. But in this case, they're spread all over the forest and we can see that we can produce, for $47 a ton, we can produce uh, about 30,000 bone dry tons in harvest year one. But what if the facility can only pay $40 a ton? Well, the only stands that actually meet the price constraint, which is that $40 a ton, are these 
blue these blue uh, stands. And so if we can only if we can only uh, if we have to deliver it for forty dollars a ton, uh, we can only deliver twelve thousand bone dry tons in year one. And we can do this for for any year, and we can do simulations. Here's year two. Uh, for $46 a ton, we can deliver 27,000 bone dry tons. Or if the market price is $40, we can only deliver 19,000 tons. And the rest of the material is going to get burned in place. So um, that's, that's one example of that first leg of the uh, supply chain, that is feedstock production on the landscape. So let's uh, move on from these maps and move on to logistics and look at some operations on the ground. So here's uh, an example of a logistics problem. So we have two options here for moving biomass. We have treatments out on the unit, and I so showed you some pictures of slash piles. We can either collect that slash, which is pretty bulky and hard to transport. We can collect it in dump trucks and deliver it to some place, a big concentration yard, where we can then concentrate it into basically a giant slash pile and grind it into the back of these tractor trailer trucks to get it to market. So that's called slash forwarding. So we forward the slash. And the other option, we could actually take that machine and get it out in the woods and grind that material in the woods and then deliver the ground up material uh, what we call hog fuel. A hog is just another name for a grinder. We can deliver that hog fuel to a concentration yard and, and pile it up and then just dump it into um, tractor trailers using a front end loader. And these would then bring it to a place like the, um, the power plant in Gypsum, Colorado or some other facility. So flash forwarding or in woods grinding, what's better? This is just a, a classic logistics problem. What should we do here? Well, we did a study to compare these two systems on this unit that you're seeing here, um, this uh, photograph. This is what the slash like looked like on the ground, the, what we call side cast residues after timber processing. It was out there for 10 months, um, and there were 1,500 tons of this stuff. And we went out there and we measured all the trucks, weighed all the trucks, uh, took a lot of video, took a lot of stopwatch data, um, and use time study, what we call operations research, to compare the productivity and costs of these operations. And this is what industry does all the time. They're trying to drive down their costs um, and, and increase their productivity, so deliver more material at lower cost. So here's an example. I won't go through this table, but this is the level of detail that we typically generate in one of these studies. We, where we look at every single piece of machine that's operating and we look at how much material it can move, um, what its productivity is, that BDT is just bone dry tons, um, SMH is scheduled machine hours, so bone dry tons per hour, and we can look at the cost, the dollars per bone dry ton, and compare different pieces of equipment. And what you'll notice here is that Dump trucks moving bulky slash, it really doesn't weigh a lot. It takes up a lot of space. And on a bone dry ton basis, it's really expensive. $10.40 a bone dry ton to move that stuff. Um, and in the inward grinding component, you'll see um, on the right hand side, last column, 901 for the grinder. The grinder is a really expensive piece of equipment, too. It's a high productivity piece of equipment, but it's pretty expensive. So let's get to the punchline here. Um, we can compare different systems in logistics on how much these systems cost to process material. Flash forwarding in this particular case was $24.80 a bone dry ton, and inwards grinding was $24.52 a bone dry ton. Pretty close. Um, we, they're actually much closer than we expected. But I want you to notice the purple slices of the, the pies here. For slash forwarding, grinding was just 25% of that total, and inwards grinding it was 43%. And the grinder is typically the most expensive piece of equipment, so we want to maximize its productivity when we're talking about producing biomass. And so when I see that big purple piece of the puzzle devoted to the grinder, 
that's a problem. Um, I'm going to skip over this figure just in the interest of time, but I'll just um, let you know that this is what I'm talking about when I when I look at the grinder. When the grinder is in the woods, um, on the right hand side, the top purple circle there, 27 bone dry tons an hour. The grinder can actually work at 41 bone dry bone dry tons an hour. And that's a big difference. And, and in these systems, we want to keep the grinder working at maximum capacity. So we can start to pull these systems apart. And one of the things that's advantageous about slash forwarding is that we can decouple the, the on-woods operation, the in-woods, uh, on, on the treatment unit operations from the grinding, which is good from a logistics standpoint. And um, another way to put this is that if you look at that long row of slash where we just have one kind of continuous um, row of slash that we can chew up and keep feeding the grinder, that's a pretty good production scenario. When piles are spread out all over the landscape, that starts to get really expensive. And that's all this figure shows. I'll, I'll skip over this just in the interest of time. So that's a little glimpse in terms of how we treat logistics, both in industry but also on the science side. And now I want to talk a little bit about conversion technology. So uh, as you probably know by this point, um, there's a lot of different technologies that we can use to take woody biomass and, and make products out of it, either heat, electricity, liquid fuels, solid products, things like that. Some of those involve microbes, um, digestion and fermentation by microbes. To, uh, those are bioconversion processes. And then others involve heat, so thermochemical conversion processes. Things like combustion, just burning the material to produce heat and electricity, steam. Then there are gasification technologies that put a twist on that. And sometimes we can capture gases from gasification, heating woody biomass at really high temperature, and, and actually make liquid fuel out of that and chemicals. Um, that's a pretty well-established uh, pathway, technically. And then other conversion processes that are thermochemical can produce gases, liquids, solids like biochar. And so in this space, um, one of the things that, that I'm really excited about and I work on a lot is these distributed scale, smaller scale pyrolysis systems. And pyrolysis is just heating material at high temperature in the absence of oxygen. And these pyrolysis systems are exciting from the standpoint that you can uh, you can deploy them at a lot of different scales and you can produce a lot of different products from them, including the Cool Planet liquid fuel conversion processes that are part of the Banner project. So let's move on here and just talk about uh, the financial aspects of conversion. Here's a study that we worked at. Uh, worked on that was located at Pueblo Wood Products where we uh, they make dimensional lumber mostly for pallets and shipping containers and they have a residue stream of about 55 bone dry tons a day that they produce that they would love to make a product out of so we deployed a uh, uh, in, in cooperation with Pueblo Wood Products uh, and Biochar Solutions Incorporated deployed one of these uh, pyrolysis systems to make biochar and that biochar was being used in mine reclamation applications and for soil amendment. And I know you've, you've heard about those applications before, so I won't go into detail there. But uh, this was a real supply chain. And we, uh, we studied this over the course of 25 days with 22 productive days. And we collected a tremendous amount of data to characterize the productivity uh, and costs of these systems. How much feedstock is going in? How long does it take to process it? How much biochar do we get out? Um, all kinds of temperature and pressure, pressure data. We basically take the feedstock, we load it into a uh, hopper, we convert it into biochar, it got dried a little bit, and then collect the biochar out the other end. There's no liquid uh, heat or electricity uh, product here. And we're, we were most interested in the conversion rate. How much biochar do you get out compared to the feedstock you put in? What's the productivity? How many green tons of, of uh, material can this uh, machine chew up 
in the course of an hour. And then something called net present value. That's, that's a term that's used to evaluate the current value of a project. In our case, we were looking at a 10-year project, doing this for 10 years, uh, what, that might, what, what that might shake out um, in terms of do you lose money, do you earn money, uh, what's the deal here? So we looked at all kinds of different variables in these models, the purchase price, machine rate, interest rates, fuel costs, electricity costs. I won't go through any of this um, in the interest of time, but just to show you that these financial models are very intensive, include things like labor benefits, wages, insurance, all kinds of things like that. And we can look at the production levels, uh, how much material is going in, what the delays are during the, time, the work time, how much uh, you actually get out in terms of uh, material. These are all really important things if you're trying to develop a financial model for a project like this one. So in the end, uh, for the base case scenario, we uh, got a net present value for a 10-year project period of negative $168,955. Um, so this base case we actually lost money over 10 years. And um, I'll just let you know that this was purely on a uh, production basis. There were no tax credits or anything like that in here. We also weren't using the heat um, and we were using market uh, market rates for the biochar. So costs exceed revenues in another, in another way. But if we look more closely, I'm going to skip this one. If we look more closely at the results of that study, um, we can actually see something interesting. The black dots <clears throat> are shifts that we observed that fell below the net present value equals zero line. And just to let you know, the net present value equals zero line includes a minimum rate of return of 7%. So that's like, think about that as your bank account getting 7% interest. It includes a, neg a, a minimum rate of return of 7%. So it's not exactly, uh, it, it's a break even, but it's a break even with that minimum rate of return. So we observed a whole lot of shifts that uh, in terms of productivity and conversion rate and, and uh, net present value were negative. But we observed a few that were positive. And one of the things that was a big outcome of this study is we identified all kinds of ways that the conversion process and the operation and the technology itself could be improved to push more of those black dots to the right across the net present value line into positive territory. Things like not letting the feedstock get wet with snow in the winter. Um, that drives down the conversion rate and drives down the productivity. Um, things, uh, things like uh, in, enacting some modifications to um, make sure the machine doesn't get clogged up, things like that. So uh, we have a paper uh, that's almost in print now that I'll share with everybody and, and it descri describes this study. So that's, that's the end of the three uh, kind of legs that I wanted to talk about. I want to leave some time for questions, but um, just to summarize very quickly, um, hopefully you just get the sense that really we need to be thinking about end uses for this material as the driver of the biomass supply chain. It's important that we have biomass if we're interested in uh, harvesting biomass as a fuel or raw material, but really what we need to be focused on is what are we using that for? Is it electricity? Is it liquid fuel? Is it bioproducts? Is it combined heat and power? Is it small scale heating systems at a school, for example? That's really important in terms of the scale and, and the cost structure of these supply chains. Biomass production meets multiple objectives. Hopefully you got a flavor for you know, forest management and how we think about biomass, um, not as a main objective, but as a byproduct of meeting multiple objectives. Logistics are really important in, in ter terms of determining biomass costs. And profitable conversion, even with these experimental systems, is possible. Um, there are a lot of combustion-based systems and combined heat and power systems that are very well uh, established and, and proven commercially. Uh, on the research side, we tend to focus a lot on these technologies that are on the bubble, that, may, that are on the cusp of commercial, commercialization 
um, and haven't yet been proven. And then the details matter. We need to be focused on where's the biomass coming from, what are the objectives, where's it going, um, and, uh, and it's really important to be talking about details. I want to thank um, the many co-authors that I've had on, over uh, you know, my tenure here working on biomass research. There's a lot of folks in a lot of different institutions, um, cooperating organizations and industry partners. I also want to thank our funders um, and let you know for sure, hopefully you've already heard these names, but the National Institute of Food and Agriculture is a huge uh, supporter financially of these efforts, including not just the CSU banner project, uh, but the Rocky Mountain Research Station Biomass Research and Development Initiative project. I serve as the project director for that project. It's a $5.3 million project. Um, and it's, it's uh, both of those projects are funded by the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And then the U.S. Forest Service has uh, provided a lot of funding for these types of research efforts, um, both through the Rocky Mountain Research Station and through the National Fire Plan and the Washington Office of Research and Development. So I will leave it at that, point you toward the banner website for additional resources. Feel free to contact me at any time if you want to uh, talk about these sorts of things. And, um, and I hope, hopefully we'll see you in another webinar in the future sometime as well on some of these other topics that I, that I research. Thanks, Nate. Uh, questions from folks, either you can unmute yourself or type into the chat, either way. I have a question. Great, Logan. Um, Nate, I was wondering that that last study that uh, resulted in the net loss of revenue. In that study, they were only making biochar out of the biomass. There wasn't any fuels production. Is that right? That that's right. Um, th that particular unit, but the uh, biochar solutions incorporated manufactured that unit, and Pueblo Wood Products was using it. Um, there was no heat capture. Uh, that's something we talk about in the paper is they actually have kilns on site there where they dry products for export for heat treating. We, were, we didn't uh, use any um, offset of uh, fossil fuel for that. So yeah, the only revenues in that model were from the sale of biochar for soil amendment. There was no liquid fuel product and no uh, heat byproduct um, or heat offset. So does that mean that um, the addition of those might generate enough revenue to actually make that a net positive, or does that add so many new costs that it's hard to even compare the two? You just hit the nail on the head. Um, absolutely. Anytime you make a new product, it's only value added if your uh, revenues from that product exceed your costs. Um, so. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. It, it, some of these systems, we worked with two different systems in Oregon um, by two different manufacturers that made not just a biochar product, but a bio oil output and a gas product, um, all three together. So this multi-phase output. Um, one of the challenges at small scales is fuels um, from biomass, from thermochemical processes at small scales tend to have high variability. And um, and that's not good if you're going to put that in your ga the gas tank of your car. So a lot of those outputs require refining and upgrading, and that incurs another cost. So, you know, in the the uh, era of cheap gasoline, it seems to have come upon us in the last couple of months. If your end product is it, the, the if the market price of your end product is less than the costs that you incur to, to produce that product, um, then you're in that negative territory and that's a bad thing. So for the particular, for the BSI unit, that wasn't an option. Heat was definitely an option. And so we could have used some uh, relatively straightforward heat capture technology and offset uh, natural gas or propane. So that would have been a good use of that heat. So the trick, the trick with something like uh, Cool Planet is going to be to keep their costs below the market, uh, the market cost of their uh, product, which sometimes includes uh, incentives for renewable fuel, things like that. 
So Nate, there are a couple questions in the chat box if you have access to that. One is about um, how bark beetle kill is used and another um, which I'm in interested in too is um, kind of the educational implications and if we can get any get our grubby hands on any data that we might be able to um, you know adapt for student use. So do you see those two questions in the chat box? Sure, I, I do now. I just I just loaded up. So let me deal with the bark beetle one first. Um, so this this is a great this is a great question. And um, generally we look at so bark beetles uh, are are unique in the scale at which they affect forest ecosystems in the Rocky Mountains, but they're not particularly unique from a silvicultural standpoint. Silvicultural treatments have been used to deal with uh, insects and disease outbreaks in forests for a long, long time. Um, so we think about the beetle outbreaks as um, you know, something we can use civil culture to manage. And one of the things that um, is kind of civil culture 101 stuff is you want to get in and harvest material if your objective is to salvage economic value before that uh, material, wh while that material is still useful for solid wood products. And so um, that uh, commercial, commercial timberlands often do this where uh, stand is negatively impacted by an event and they'll go in and, and get that material. And so initially during an in, in impact, uh, during um, infestation, those trees are at, as valuable as they will be for forest products. And as they stand on the stump, the longer they stay on the stump, the less value they have for uh, for solid wood products and eventually pulp and things like that. And so then we think of trees that have been standing for years as uh, if they are no longer valuable for solid wood products, that is they have uh, checking or cracking or rot or things like that that make them uh, less valuable for that. What, what could we use those uh, trees for if we decide that it achieves management objectives to do a treatment in that stand? So that's, that's an important caveat. Um, because the costs of doing that are very expensive. So it's a, it's kind of a nuanced question, but the bottom line is um, beetle kill trees can be used for lumber, and that is the, the highest value use when we talk about the value chain. Um, but we don't always uh, we don't always harvest timber for uh, beetle in beetle kill stands exclusively to capture economic value. It's a pretty complex question. And um, we're trying to get a handle on that right now as part of the, the banner project. At what point do, do these trees um, even lose their value for things like biofuels or, or uh, lesser, uh, lesser use than um, solid wood products? The next thing is, yeah, I have a bunch of data sets uh, I'd be happy to share with you in either their raw form or semi-processed form if you want to do statistics or hypothesis testing or things like that. We might want to polish them a little bit if students are going to use them to make sure they're um, not going to throw out any weird statistical phenomena that we that we deal with. But um, yeah, let, let's keep in contact. Let me know exactly what would be most valuable uh, for you in terms of data sets and I'm, I'm happy to share. That sounds great. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, I'm sure Sarah and I and probably other teachers who are interested as well um, we'll put our heads together and get in touch with you. And, and if, if I didn't if I didn't hit the nail on the head with the, the beetle kill for lumber question, uh, fire away again. David and Sarah, do you guys have any follow up questions or anyone else have questions for Nate? One thing I will mention about standing dead trees um, is they they tend to fall down, <laughs> and this was a question that we uh, grappled with at the banner an an annual meeting. Is once those trees are on the ground in kind of a jackstrawed configuration, those logistics costs that I talked talked about um, go up very rapidly. There are safety concerns with stands that are that are coming down like that. Um, there are value concerns with the the, the uh, timber that's that's there and the wood quality. 
um, and their operational costs get very steep very quickly. So one of the things I think that is uh, underappreciated is the extent to which logistics costs um, make beetle kill stands uh, very difficult to handle and that even if there's a market for materials, um, the market price has to be quite high to support going into stands that, that have been, um, that are in that condition. That's a tough proposition. Again, even if we decide that's the right thing to do from a management standpoint, which it always isn't, isn't a given. Um, it's, there's a, it's a pretty complex question whether or not we would even want to do that. I think you have a few more questions. Looks like we have two more questions. Um, I'm, I'm getting one just in the box. Uh, let's, oh, here we go. I can't, I can't speak to Wyoming uh, specifically, but I definitely um, Colorado, Colorado, um, Montana, throughout the Rockies, Wyoming, I'm sure, in the Black Hills. Um, Mike Battaglia, I'm in Fort Collins today. I'm normally in Missoula, right across the hall. There's a lot of work uh, in the Black Hills. Um, and I think a lot of the operations and logistics research is done in other parts of the country with um, you know, different issues, but we're trying to trying to do as much as we can in the Rockies. So I'd love to put Wyoming on that list. So let me see the other questions. Above, oh. above that is a question from David. Oh, sorry. Another question from David. So um, yeah, I think this is where I want to highlight that red, big red thing. Details matter. This is the type of comment. Uh, and question that is uh, kind of fundamental is what are we talking about when it when we say it doesn't make sense to use beetle kill trees? Where are the trees? Who owns them? What what are the ownership objectives? What are the man management objectives? Um, and I'll give you one exam example at the extreme end. Beetle kill trees in wilderness areas are, are are make no sense, right? Because it doesn't meet our management objectives one, but it also is. Uh, <laughs> even in, in remote areas and steep areas is, is extremely um, is extremely difficult and costly to get to. Back that out to the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, trees that are on private land in dense stands that are going to receive treatment anyway for fuel uh, mitigation in the wildland urban interface. Um, those trees are going to be cut. They're going to be piled and burned anyway for disposal the economics starts to change quite a bit. And so in this spectrum where we have, you know, truly commercial timber harvests that generate positive net revenue and produce byproduct biomass, um, that's kind of the low hanging fruit. And then we have beetle kill trees that are treated right now in stands that are being burned for disposal. So I think this this question really highlights the ideas. We need to have a really good handle on what the end use is, what what costs that end use can bear in terms of uh, market prices and cost structure, and where that material will be co coming from. That's a really important thing. So I think the details matter, and a lot of people see a lot of promise for biomass from all different types of forest um, treatments as a feedstock for liquid fuel production. And if we didn't think it had any promise, we, we wouldn't be working on it. So Nate, I want to point you, if you scroll up, I think we missed a question from um, David about taking kids into the field um, oh. to survey forest plots and looking for areas suitable for timber harvest or biofuel fuel harvest. Uh, yeah, I, did, I didn't, uh, let's see, I'm try, just trying to scroll through. Oh so, yeah, the questions are coming in now. <laughs> Sorry, we won't yeah. get, we'll have to do another one. But just in terms of bringing kids into the woods, I think it's a great idea. I think it, it really um, it, the picture's worth a thousand words, right? So a field experience is worth worth a thousand pictures in my mind. Um, yeah, let's get him out there. I have no idea what the administrative and kind of legal aspects of that are, but I'm willing to to work uh, with whoever we have to to get the paperwork signed. <laughs> so, yeah. If the question okay, let, last the quick yeah. question about how long it takes a tree to dry to bone dry in slash piles. 
Oh, that's a that's a really good question. When we talk about bone dry tons, we're not talking about material that is zero percent moisture content. When, whenever you hear people talk about bone dry tons, they're, what they're actually doing is normalizing the metric to uh, a zero moisture content metric. So um, we think about green residues as being 50% water, and we can we can talk about uh, residues across the board, no matter what their moisture content, as boiling that down to uh, you know 50. 50 bone dry tons, 100 green tons, but it's it's easier. Um, so typically, just to give you the range, materials coming off a sawmill sign, green lumber, we like to think about those as half, you know, 50% water. If you field dry materials, you can get them down to 30%. I've seen them as low as 26%. Branches in Idaho that are just kind of sticking out there in the air, the dry air, those things can get uh, down to 16%. So that's a that's a good point. We're not talking about drying materials to zero percent. A lot of technologies have to get it to ten percent, but really what we're talking about is just normalizing it so we don't have to deal with moisture content at all. So you and I are speaking the same language. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Nate. That was really awesome and fascinating. And I'm sure that a lot of us may be contacting you in the future. So uh, prepare for prepare for that. And if anyone has other questions, um, Nate's email address is here, um, and I'm sure he'd be happy to to respond. And if you um, if you just Google my name, Nate Anderson or Nathaniel Anderson and Forest Service, you should get my profile, and that's linked to uh, a lot of publications. Some of the some of the stuff I talked about today isn't in print yet. As soon as it is, I'll post post it there. But you can uh, check out some papers and publications um, on my website and then uh, the Banner website as well. Great. Yeah, so so they're starting to post a lot of things. That's a good point. I'm starting to post a lot of publications from folks on the Banner website. Are they um, posting the actual PDFs or just the links, which is um, potentially an issue with copyright? And so, yeah, um, so this if is they're not able to do that, we can, we can put some stuff on Basecamp. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, the the stuff that's behind a, a pay firewall or a paywall, um, anything that I author because I'm a federal employee, I'm not subject to copyright. So you'll see a lot of um, journal articles on my website that are available for download. That doesn't violate copyright because um, I'm not subject to it. Cool. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you so much, Nate. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, and uh, yeah, great, great. Uh, so glad to have you all involved in this. And and um, yeah, keep in touch. Let me know if you need anything. Thanks, Nate. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.